a little logistical um, stuff. We're going to have our the first part of the Anapanasati Sutta Saturday, and we'll conclude that on Tuesday, and that will conclude uh, our study of the Pasana. Um, this sutta, the Bhattacharata Sutta, fits in nicely with that, and also with just the New Year's Eve and moving into a new year, focus on what is uh, auspicious. And you'll notice this is another uh, rather short sutta, but another complete teaching. And the focus falls right in line with the Vipassana structure study that we had that um, a, a few different ways a Buddha addresses eye making. Uh, one is through speculative uh, self-establishment and another is just sim simply with constant um, clinging to the five clinging aggregates. And let me read it, it'll become much more clear than my kind of garbled introduction. The Buddha was staying in Savati at Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. There he addressed the monks, friends, I will teach you the meaning of an auspicious day. Do not chase after the past or project your thoughts to the future. That is a complete Dhamma teaching, by the way, if you can actually do it. And of course we can do it within the framework of the Eightfold Path, because that's exactly where, that's the culmination of the path, of the path, isn't it? To not be in the past and not be in the future, to have my mind united in my body in a way and through a structure that allows me to keep it there, not getting distracted. The Buddha continues, not entangled with the world, be mindful only of what is occurring. Another complete teaching, isn't it? Free of distraction, well concentrated, meaning of jhana. Develop compassion informed by wisdom. Again, notice the Buddha didn't say, be compassionate, care about everyone. Of course we do. But he knows that that's truly impossible without wisdom, if we're still stuck in ignorance. Mindfully engage with what is skillful. What is skillful? What is it skillful to mindfully engage in? Somebody better answer or we're closing this place down. The Eightfold Path. In the Buddha's teachings, he teaches true mindfulness, useful mindfulness, is to be mindful of each factor of the Eightfold Path. And that foundation of mindfulness then allows us to be mindful of life as life occurs. The future is uncertain and death occurs equally for all. Those who remain mindfully engaged with life as life occurs throughout the day have had a truly auspicious day. And how does one avoid chasing after the past? Look at the, how clear the Buddha teaching is on avoiding speculation and how it contradicted nearly every so-called spiritual teaching of his time and it contradicts nearly every so-called Buddhist teaching today. And how does one avoid chasing after the past? One does not get carried away with the delight that in the past I had such a form, in the past I had such a feeling, in the past I had such a perception, in the past I had such a fabrication, in the past I had such a consciousness. What's the Buddha referring to there? And five clean angers. I remember a couple of lectures, specifically where I was, but I heard this often in many different places. Um, and I won't say where it was because it'll sound like I'm putting the place down. It's just what occurred there. But the importance that was placed that when you awaken, the way you tell that you're awakened is you'll know all your past lives. And what is the Buddha teaching here? He says, it's all nonsense. It's all speculation. Don't go there. Keep your mind with what's occurring right here and right now. This is called not chasing after the past by not in installing yourself through the five clinging aggregates in the past or in the future. And how does one not project their thoughts on the future? One does not get carried away with the same delight. In the future, I might have such a form. In the future, I may have such a feeling. In the future, I might have such a perception. In the future, I might have such a fabrication. In the future, I might have such a consciousness. Of course you might. It's all speculation. I can tell you right now that I just might have the world's greatest consciousness in three days. That's a true statement, isn't it? I might. I'm not likely, but I might. 
anything that, and, and I'm just kidding myself when I say something like that to myself or to you. I might be the, the center fielder for the Yankees this year. I might. It's not likely, but I might. The, the whole problem with religion and spirituality is just this. It teaches us a method of typical, uh, typically that if we change something in our behavior, we'll get a reward in the future. That's all I'm making, isn't it? The, the most um, largest, meaning the number of people that practice it, form of Buddhism uh, is pure land Buddhism, or my, my Chiran is kind of a, an offset of that, which basically teaches that if you keep, if you chant this very particular chant, you say it over and over again, keep it on your lips all the time, and if it's on your lips when you die, you'll immediately be taken to, to Amitabha Buddha heaven, where you'll be taken care of by the Amitabha Buddha forever. That's the largest, most practiced form of Buddhism today. It's complete speculation, isn't it? And, it's a, and I'm not putting it down. People, have, people can practice whatever they want to practice. But it, it contradicts everything that the Buddha teaches, doesn't it? It's all rooted in eye making. I'm doing something now so in the future I can have my reward. Well, that was so disappointing to me. I didn't even realize it all those years that I was striving to get my future reward. Because in this moment, what I'm telling myself is I'm not good enough. This isn't enough. This isn't enough of a human being. I need to be more. And when you hear me say teaching a false dhamma is cruel, that's what I mean. Because we can't help but apply it on ourselves that there's something wrong with me. Well, the Buddha says there's nothing wrong with anybody except what we think of ourselves. That's the great teaching. And if we can let go of that in this present moment, I'm free. Free of what? Free of my own ignorance. This is called not projecting thoughts onto the future. And how does one become entangled with the world? An uninstructed, ordinary person lacking understanding of the Dhamma sees form as a self or the self as form. Self-identification. Confused they see feeling as self or the self as possessing feeling. I had a rough day today. Confused, they see their perceptions as self or the self as possessing perceptions. Confused, they see their fabrications as self or their self as their fabrications. And we all do that, don't we? We identify with, with what are merely our own thoughts. And as we understand the Dhamma, those thoughts are rooted in the ignorance of the way things are. And yet we believe them. We follow our own thoughts. Confused, they see their consciousness as self or their self as their consciousness. It just means that the way I think is the way I'm going to see myself. This is what is meant by becoming entangled with the world. The direct teaching is there. We become entangled in the world by seeing ourselves entangled in the world. We establish ourselves in a fabricated way in the world, and we insist on keeping ourselves there. The tension arises when we feel it slipping away, the fabrication. It's the main difficulty people have in developing the Dhamma because it feels like annihilation. It's because we are directly disentangling ourselves from the world that it feels like that. It's true. We are annihilating ourselves, but it's a fabricated self. It's like foam on the ocean. We're anni annihilating the thing that is rooted in ignorance and can only cause the stress and suffering. On New Year's Eve, it's, a good, it's, it's appropriate to say good riddance to it, isn't it? I'm not going to sing it. And how is one not entangled with the world? A follower of the Dhamma, who is well-versed and well-trained in the Dhamma, does not see form as the self or the self as possessing form. They do not see, with, with right view established, they do not see feeling as a self or the self possessing feelings. With right view established, they do not see perceptions as a self or the self as possessing percep perceptions. With right view established, they do not see fabrications as self or as a self. Possessing, possessing would mean my fabrication is something I own. It's mine. And so once we do that, we have to defend it because it's who we are. With right view established, they do not see consciousness as a self or the self as possessing consciousness. Can you imagine that? Well, you should and you can. Can you imagine not having a self-referential consciousness, seeing your thoughts as yourself or yourself as possessing your thoughts? You're all developing that, aren't you? And we talk about it all the time. Every time we talk about the practical recognition and experience of diminishing eye making, that's what we're talking about. And, and that's the constant topic of conversation, especially the last six, 
uh, four months here on this with this study. This is called not being entangled in the world. To develop an auspicious day, remain present with your life as your life occurs. Do not chase the past or project your thoughts to the future. Remain free of entanglements with the world and mindful of what is occurring. Be mindful of impermanence and uncertainty. Those are really two sides of the same coin. Those that do so, let me go back to that, just say it again. Be mindful of impermanence and uncertainty. Those that do so will have an auspicious day. So says this peaceful sage. I love the last line. Thank you. That's the end of the sutta. So says this peaceful sage. And we're, we're learning all to be peaceful sages. We had a little bit of a conversation earlier that, that relates to this, doesn't it? This idea of, as authentic Dharma practitioners, do we read something else or do we go, do we have some fun? Do we go bowling on Thursday night or go to a New Year's Eve party? Of course we do. We simply remain mm -hmm. entangled from the world in doing that. If we're reading a book, I'm, we're talking about Robert Heinlein. When I was a kid and I read Heinlein, for days I, I saw myself in the, as in the book. In other words, I was living on these different planets and having, I mean, that was the consciousness that I had. It was wonderful and it was a huge distraction. Maybe that's why when I picked it up again, it didn't do the same thing for me. We can do anything we want in the world as long as we're not doing it for me to establish me. And if I let me out of it, if I don't take anything that I'm doing personally, then I'm free. Then my mind stays united in my body. I maintain a calm and peaceful mind no matter what's occurring. And I'm living within the framework of the Dhamma. I've established an auspicious day moment by moment in my own mind. So let's uh, go with the folks online first and start with Jane. Jane, how are you? I'm well. How are you, John? I'm good. Happy New Year. Oh, that's, I just want to wish everyone a peaceful, happy new year. Thank you. Thank you for the auspicious teaching. Yeah, it's a great one, huh? It is. Well, you'll hear it again soon. Okay. <laughs> Always on retreat. I'm glad you joined us tonight. Thank you. Trevor, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for the teaching, John. Glad to uh, join you all by distance here. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Uh, I had a question. <clears throat> so this piece about feeling and uh, not possessing feeling, feeling is impermanent. Um, one thing I've been wondering about, if feelings are impermanent <clears throat> and transitory, why do we keep holding out the idea of lasting happiness and peace, which seem like feelings as a result of um, liberation? Yeah, what, a, what a, a great question, Trevor. And it shows, one of the reasons why we do this is I tell I can tell from people's questions whether it's coming from developing the Dhamma or not. And obviously that question does. Uh, it does seem like there's a paradox and a kind of a contradiction in there. Uh, and and it's difficult to explain because it's, it's, it's that part of the Dhamma that has to be directly experienced to truly understand that you can have a feeling and it's not a self-referential feeling. It's just, it's a human-based feeling. It's a feeling because I'm a human being. But when I separate the me from the feeling, then no matter what the feeling is, it doesn't cause stress or distraction or any more eye making. It's simply just a feeling. So it, again, it's, it, it can be difficult to imagine being happy without me being happy until you actually experience it or being sad without me being sad. But what the Buddha, there's another sutta I thought of teaching tonight because it's kind of appropriate, um, the Vitaka Santana Sutta. In that sutta, the Buddha teaches that we gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it, which means in the moment, whatever is appropriate for me to think, that's what will flow out of me because I'm present for this moment. So in the moment, I might be sad because it's what I just, I just, I just heard a, a close friend died. And of course, I'm a human being, I'm going to be sad, but I won't, I won't, my mind won't go towards how can I live without that person or how could su such an awful thing happen or any of those things. It's just somebody died. And mm -hmm. as a human being who's present in the world, there's, there's a, there's a non-self referential sadness. It just is. It's just that way. Mm -hmm. Um, as you continue to deepen your understanding and under and 
start gaining a little bit deeper understanding of the five clinging aggregates and how we identify so strongly with form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness, mm -hmm. this will make even more sense and, being, and, and make even, uh, be even more significant teaching because you're getting to the essence of the Dhamma. And the four foundations of mindfulness, the beginning section is the Buddha's instructions on a, appropriate meditation and jhana meditation. He starts by telling us to, to bring our, be mindful of the breath and the body. And then he says, be mindful of feelings and thoughts arising and passing away. Mm -hmm. Instead of be mindful of feelings and figure them out and analyze them and attach yourself and decide what's good and what's bad and what's pleasant and unpleasant, notice that feelings and thoughts are, are impermanent, they're mm -hmm. impersonal, and they simply arise and pass away. And mm -hmm. so the direct action of right meditation, meaning jhana meditation, starts bringing that disentanglement with our own feelings and our own thoughts, and so a disentanglement to, with the world in a direct way. So I hope I helped you with that yeah, rather yeah. long answer to an important question, but thank you. Thank you so much. Very helpful. I look forward to seeing you Saturday, too. Me, too. Thanks. Thank you, Thad. Good to see you. How are you? Well, let me get your... Hey, I think you're... I think you can talk. Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, that, that question about uh, uh, happiness, you know, how and, and feeling that was brought up. That that's uh, uh, that that to me uh, speaks about faith in the practice. You know, uh, in in some religions, faith entails uh, <clears throat> speculation about the nature of heaven or the nature of eternity etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. but uh where i'm where i am now if i uh, ignorant of four noble truths and all that any speculation that i have about the nature of nibbana or the nature of this happiness is purely that it's my speculation i have to have faith in the fact that the buddha says this is possible and then return to practice uh and uh, that's about all I can do with that right now. Uh, I'm at the place where <clears throat> I simply uh, notice that I'm having all these self-referential feelings and speculations all the time. At least that's a little bit of progress. I'm aware that I'm doing that it's you know, yeah. through, through, through jhana and through, through meditation. And it's not so much uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm not having uh, my day filled, it's not as if I'm having an auspicious day, but at least I'm recognizing that I'm not having an auspicious day, if that makes sense. That makes and sense. I think that's a little bit of progress, yeah. yeah. But thank, uh, thank you and thank everyone for being here tonight and uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, thank you, Thad. Uh, again, I, from your comments, you're, you're developing the Dhamma just as it should be. And the, the first thing you come up against and start realizing is the essence of the, the eye making that's occurring and you have to if you're going to recognize it you have to recognize it first so you can abandon it uh, and it, you're, you're just doing it um exactly as intended it's just this way so, glad you joined us happy new year happy new year lorna how are you good thanks um today i found myself realizing that um maybe it was just becoming here for about four years thoughts that I've ever had have gone away. All my feelings that I've ever had have gone away. And I kind of just got that. I realized just um, really how freeing that can be. When you really realize that all your thoughts will go away. All of them. And your feelings will all just go away. Yeah. Um, so I kind of thought about that today. Um, read the sutra at home. Really got choked up about it. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and I must say, if I was a person that when I came to class, I used to like quickly choose my sutras and then turn up to class. 
appropriately, you know. I think this one would be one that I'll come to ask for. <laughs> you never so did that. that. I, no, I don't do that. But if if I did, this would be one that I came to ask for. It's just um, it's it's a great filter. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, probably one of my favourites. Um, it's talking about distraction, distraction in the moment. Uh, I know we're supposed to not get caught up in our thoughts, even though we may have thoughts, don't get caught up in the thoughts. But when you're going about your day, it's um, for a distraction to come into your mind, it's almost saying mm. that the, the current moment isn't enough for your mind. You want more. Uh, that's how I kind of feel a distraction is that I can't stay with the current moment because it's, it feels like it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's not. Um, it's too spare. It's, no, yeah, yeah, it's not enticing enough. Yeah. It's not, uh, not interesting enough or whatever. And I think that kind of leaves you, your mind open to it dreaming up of distraction just to yep. sort of fluff it up a bit or something mm -hmm. um, and that's how I see a lot of my distractions that they just there uh, to distract it's, it's a funny one of the things I sort of talk about uh, well it's it's an aspect of grasping isn't it yeah 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 in this moment I need something to be different in, in that moment it's your mind mm -hmm. I need something I need something to distract me but I don't know why you need more than what is available. I mean, I don't need more of everything. <coughs> yeah, you don't. Or, you know, in other ways of life. But why, why doesn't the mind just stay settled with... You know the answer. Don't ask why. No, well, you know the answer to the question. You can't ask. Why is it that your mind is unsettled in this moment? Ultimately, what's the underlying cause? Because I'm ignorant of one other thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know there's a... Solution to that. But I'm not ignorant of the four noble truths. Well, <laughs> I've been coming here four years. <laughs> yes, you are. I'm here to tell you, you are ignorant of four noble truths. <laughs> you, it shows you, she's developing her mindfulness yes. and it's, and it's in the appropriate way. That, as in your mind, more, to as, understand the subtlety. And as your mindfulness develops, then you get more control over mm. staying present. Which is just, oops, which is just what. Warren is describing. Because we all describe that. Uh, to go to something earlier, what you said, that instead of feeling that, uh, that feeling of despair of annihilation, she's feeling free. And that's a mm -hmm. perfect mm -hmm. uh, example of development right. of that's her right. practice. Yeah, well, thank you. And so in that moment, Lorna, there's no fear anymore, is there? It almost sounds like there's yeah. an expectation of continued development of your understanding. Now, I'm putting words in your yeah, mouth, too. I, 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 can't, I can't weave fear into that. I, I don't yeah, think fear I don't, I don't think it's there. No. And so the fear of annihilation is gone. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it, that's remarkable. It, it, it's something that Thad said, too, that kind of relates to this, the idea of, uh, of faith. And uh, so... And not to call you out on this, Dad, but the there's really no faith in the Dhamma because ref, taking true refuge um, means that we understand that a human being did this for himself. He awakened and he taught us how to do it. And we have a well-informed Sangha. Those are the three jewels. Those are the three things necessary to develop the Dhamma. And so we have it established. We're not taking it anything on faith because we're developing the actual experience of it. Um, there's a, a word, oh, I gotta I can say it, I can't think of it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, we enter into the Dhamma, not through faith, but with conviction. And there's a difference in that. I can, I can, 
commit to developing the Dhamma with conviction because I understand what I just said, that a human being did this. There's nothing magical about it. I, I, have, I have found the most remarkable thing in my lifetime. I found his teachings. They're still available. I have a mind that can develop it. Not that I have any special kind of mind. I have a human mind that can understand the Dhamma. And I'm fortunate enough that I have a Sangha, that I can have the direct experience of the Dhamma. Mm-hmm. Nothing is taken on faith. Faith is being placed by uh, invitation to come to. Yes, a hipposico. And it, it's much, much like, I think I used this analogy a week or so ago, so here it goes again. It, it's, it's much like I want to go to school um, to become a brain surgeon. Be careful of that. And so the, the, because I take my study seriously and where I'm going with it, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at five or six or seven medical schools to find the best for me. And then I'm going to look at the professors to find the best professors for me. And then out of conviction, after doing that investigation, then I'll go to go to that particular school. I'm not going to that school based on faith and hope that they can teach me because I did my work. I understand that they can. The Dhamma is the same way. Once we understand what we're doing, and it doesn't take all that long to, to understand the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path, then with deep conviction, we develop the Dhamma. So what do you think about what I just said, Ted? Well, I certainly agree. And I don't have, perhaps faith is that is that word that you, you know, that we have in our vocabulary that's sort of a go-to word. But yeah, oh, yeah. Epigasaco, I think, is, is, is the term that you're, that you're referring to. Just yeah. come and see. And by come and seeing, you have the convictions. Conviction would be a better word. Yeah. And that, that's, that, that's what, uh, what, what I meant. Yeah. Uh, you, you faith is, uh, and I was trying to contrast the difference between that and faith as it's understood as a belief in a in a in a theory or a, or a, or, a, or a concept, etc. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's two different things, isn't it? You know, there's right. the, the, there's nothing. The Buddha's Dhamma is simply practical human understanding. That's all. Thank you, Tim. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Um, I think to extend upon what Laura was saying, and this this sutta, when I read it, um, the, the Buddha seems to be addressing um, the clinging and craving aspect of the five aggregates, because uh, to avoid chasing the past, I think I'm stating obvious, obvious is the is the uh, clinging. And the, not to project the thoughts into the future is the craving. And then he explains how did one become entangled in the world? And that's through the ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. And, and then he offers the way to alleviate that through right view. Yep. And right view, by definition, is to understand the Four Noble Truths. Yep. And that's if, if uh, on a moment to moment basis, if that can be articulated in the mind, you will have an auspicious moment. <laughs> <laughs> you just did a pretty good job of articulating that in your mind. Um, Thank you. But yeah, so that's, you know, um, maybe I got lucky that it, that it snapped to me like that when I read it a couple times, but I, I really understood this very well. and. I, I understand what Lauren's saying too, and, and I feel that way often, but then I realize that I think we can be ignorant of the Four Noble Truths at any particular moment, but through our concentration and through our practice, we can recognize that and do things to become more, to understand it. So it's almost like, it's, it's not like today, I'm ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, but at this moment, yeah. whatever whatever contact we may come in come contact with, emotions or feelings, I, 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 I may, be, may be saying that incorrectly, but no, that's yeah. kind of how, how I see it as I'm developing the Dhamma, because sometimes I'll be beside myself, and through con- taking breath and coming back to the breath and understanding, I can understand why I was ignorant at that moment yeah. of, of those four noble truths. Yeah, again, 
very auspicious what you just said. And ignorance is is part of the world, and so it is impermanent. And there's times when it when ignorance is front and center, and there's times when wisdom is front and center, until we can as until we reach the culmination of the path, which is could be any moment. I, I told Lorna, she'll, she'll awaken by Christmas. <laughs> I just never say which Christmas. So. <laughs> it, it, and it, it, is, it is just that. It's just, it, it's looking at what's occurring right here and right now and not adding anything to it. Mm -hmm. And that alone is a definition of freedom, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is, this is what it is. This is, this is, and yeah. It's only a self-referential ego self that would be foolish enough to say what's occurring right now should be different because it can't be, could it? No matter how unpleasant this moment is, we can't change that. We can change the way we think about it. Thank you. Hello, Mary. Hello, John. Happy New Year. Happy Thank New you. Year Happy to everyone. New Year. Um, I'm on this sutra. Um, there's so much in it. Um, you know, the auspicious day is the understanding the third level of truth and the absence of uh, ignorance and understanding what isn't there, such as feelings or thoughts or um, self-referential views, etc. Um, and I think through the direct experience, you know, we have those moments and then we that direct experience takes the place of any need for any faith because yep. we know it can be. And we just, you know, get up every day to have more of those uh, aus auspicious moments, auspicious days. Um, you know, and it just kind of starts all coming together. Um, so, anyway, thank you, John. Uh, thank you. David. Okay. Thank you for your past year of teaching. And, uh, it's been a pleasure to see how the sadha has grown and developed and uh, just the depth of understanding. You can just see it yeah. every time someone speaks. And yeah. That's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of. So. It really is. It's a, thank you for saying that. Uh, I guess I've been teaching for about 10 years and 2019 was a remarkable year. Yeah. It, it, you're right. The Sangha came together in a, in a way that was building all those years. I think um, this last study, um, everybody stayed with it. You know, that was, we went pretty deep in that Vipassana structured study. And I was wondering, even when I was putting it together, which took me a couple, three months to just organize it. Um, wondering if it was going to be like too intense and too too focused and it wasn't was it it's just it, in the again to a person the sangha has developed in a remarkable way and in, including uh the folks that have joined us online and it's you know i'll, I'll take some credit as a teacher I, i'm not i'm not gonna you know have uh what's the false whatever it is false pride in it i know i'm a good teacher but i'm a good teacher because of the dharma and we're developing as a Sangha, not because of your teacher. I have a part of it in the Sangha. We're developing the Dhamma as a Sangha because of the Dhamma. I just mentioned it, the three, the three jewels. When I think about this, and, and, I, and I mention it often, this incredible human being figured something out 2,600 years ago, and we're still practicing it today, and it still works. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. So, thank you all. Really, it's been a remarkable year. Brett, good to see you. Good to see you too. <clears throat> um, thank you for your teaching. And uh, I don't really have much to say, but it's good to be here. And uh, I'm glad uh, we're in Sangha here. And it's a great place to be able to come. So yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you. Michael, good to see you. Uh, same here, John. Good to see you and everyone else here also. Um, I really don't know what direction to go with this, but I'll um, go in, you know, I'll see what I can come up with here. Um, I kind of like look at the whole thing, uh, the whole practice, practicing the Dhamma, okay? Living the Dhamma, understanding it leads to the cessation of ignorance. 
every time we come across experience ignorance, if we don't entangle ourselves in that ignorance, if we recognize it, we exercise restraint, we don't become entangled, and we handle whatever situation that life unfolds in that manner, with the eight inner eye, the eightfold eye, uh, that's going to leave us where we want to be without looking in the future, am I going to be liberated? Okay. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. am I going to be enlightened by Christmas next year, whatever. But I just feel that that's the way uh, uh, it just happens upon you. I also like to look at the more we practice the Eightfold Path uh, as life occurs to us, the less discord we are going to have Cognize, okay? This part in the mind is probably the last of uh, things that we have to solve or are going to abandon or pass away. <coughs> That's the point where it's hard. But like, yeah. I come to understand it like that. But like, anytime I'm experiencing this part, I'm being that's alleviated by right view, eightfold path. I find that the more discord that we alleviate from our lives, the uh, greater peace we find in our inner minds. And again, it's make that state in that space brings us into this uh, to a peaceful abiding. Yeah. I think that's basically. Yeah, you're doing. It's excellent. You're doing a very good job. And you know, as we as we diminish the conflict within ourselves, we are diminishing the conflict in the world directly, because we're in the world. It doesn't have to be any grand gesture at all. The most you hear me say it over and over again. The most responsible thing. If we really, really care about other human beings, the most loving and compassionate thing I can do for every human being is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. Because I'm directly diminishing the conflict in the world. And it's just that way. It doesn't mean that everyone's gonna do it and that we're, you know, we're, we're gonna live in utopia. It, it's probably not gonna happen, but it doesn't matter. It's not the point. Thank you. Hello, Julia. Hi, Julie. I feel like, yeah, well, Cassandra has become my companion, so I feel at home here, and we look forward to coming and to learn from everyone, from you, John, and from everyone here. Um, we feel like you're, you're family, yeah. too. What are we having for breakfast tomorrow? <laughs> 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 That's true. I just got to explain it. The other day, when we were electric car, there, so many times I catch myself now days, like I find myself even with simple, like silly things. Like the other day, it was kind of raining, and oh, I, yeah. I was grumbling. So I kept on complaining. So I'm like, oh, why does it have to rain? Blah blah blah. I, I hate stepping on all these wet, mucky, the wet roads. Blah blah blah. And, and then I, all of a sudden, I stopped because I realized mm. I was like, I mean, that was a lot of you know, it's a lot of eye making. But <laughs> my phone, my phone's the one that It's like Julia, come on. I mean, you just you, you just like complete eye making the whole the whole mm -hmm. time about the weather, mm -hmm. something that's like not you made it all personal, all about you, the mud, the this, the that, the that. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, yeah, I know. It's it's funny how you you, you you start to catch yourself. I mean, yes, of course, I, I went, went through this whole process, but then I I realized, and I said, wow, that's that's kind. Of, it works, you know. That yeah, it, you, you start to self reflect a lot. Mm -hmm. Every little aspect of life, even simple little things like that, yeah. it's what stops you from. Doing yes, and a simple little thing is is momentous. To, I mean, that's to that's to be recognized as dharma practice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. John, don't. I mean, I don't know if anyone else would feel like this either. You know, but uh, since all we've been doing, you know, since we've been all right, you know, we've been studying here, uh, it just seems like just, and I know that this, this is what Julia was talking about. Like, I really don't care about the weather anymore. Like, what kind of day is going to be? <laughs> 
Exactly. You don't let the weather affect you every day, and it's just like that's that's mm -hmm. point of contact to deal with it, right? Just a rainy <laughs> day. But uh, it just seems like you uh, like worry about less things, and basically when you engage them, then you'll you'll, uh, you'll handle what you know, what you should. Yeah. What what we end up as during in this practice is human being, awakened human being. That I mean, in 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 the world we live in, there's nothing more ordinary than a human being, isn't it? So what's the big deal? There isn't any, <laughs> except the clinging to ignorance. That's all. That's that's what we're here to overcome. And we don't, we don't do it alone. In other words, we don't have to figure it out. All we have to do is what this guy taught us, take refuge in it and practice the Dhamma. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's just an appropriate sutta, but at any time, I think there's probably only one or two retreats that I didn't work it in, even though it wasn't on a schedule, just because it's so inspiring. If you want to hear it again soon, come to our spring retreat. Oh, yeah, spring retreat. Um, the announcement will go out January 5th, I think, but the registration is open now. Mm -hmm. If you want a single room, or if you're a woman and want to be in the quad room, I'd suggest you do it soon. Um, and the sooner the better for me, but that's April 30th to May 3rd is our next retreat. And everybody got the email on Sunday? Yes. yes. That was better? Yes, thank you, John. And Thursday? Yes, I had, you. after the, up, the uprising on Saturday, I had no choice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, the, okay, so if if we don't understand at least a base understanding of the of the aggregates, mm -hmm. many of the aspects of the eightfold path will be confusing because they're directly related to the clinging and the craving mm -hmm. and the the five mm -hmm. aggregates. Yep. W we know that the, the meditate, right meditation, right mindfulness is not directly related to the aggregates, and they're actually used to understand them better with concentration. Mm -hmm. But if somebody bypasses those aggregates, doesn't really focus on understanding them and what they do, what the damage they do, the the eightfold path can, can be misunderstood. If they yeah. read them separately. Yeah. That's why they're and not. Actually, that's why it's not. That's why it's. It's not taught separately. It's taught. Right. And, right. Right, it's mentioned. It's mentioned in many sutras, including this one. Um, the five clinging aggregates are simply the Buddha's description of the ongoing <coughs> experience, individual personal experience, of ignorance, of stress and suffering, and it's identified by the labels. In other words, when you look at yourself. The first thing we identify ourselves with is is the form, this physical form, and also the physical form of the world. We cling to both of them. <coughs> we cling to fear. How many we we I we define our life until we come to the Dhamma by how we feel. Mm -hmm. We did we 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 define success by how we feel often. Mm -hmm. And it's only a very human beings have this great ability to feel this huge gamut of different feelings. Yet as unawakened human beings, we decide, well, I only want to have these two or three feelings. The rest I have an aversion to because they don't serve my eye making. Feelings, perceptions rise from those feelings. We decide, we start forming perceptions about the world and what we like and what we dislike and how we like other people and don't like these people. And from that perception, we, we create fabrications and we become, <laughs> Democrats or Republicans, you know, just using that as an example, we get so locked into these kind of things. Or we become Yankee fans, and so we hate every, every Mets fan there is. These kind of these kind of fabrications. Of course, it's a fabrication to think that I've identified myself as a Yankee, and that means something important in the world. And so I'm going to wear a cap and a little Yankees logo so everybody knows. It, it's all a fabrication, isn't it? Mm -hmm. there's, there's no true identity. I could, I could wear a stack of Yankee hats 100 miles high. It doesn't make me a Yankee, except people do that. And it's a, that's just a good example that we do all the time. And the thinking that allowed all this to take place, the, the self-identification to form perception, fabrications, et cetera, and feelings, is rooted in consciousness. 
So when we look at the five clinging aggregates, that is how we des describe ourselves to ourselves and to the world. So it's just a brilliant way of looking and identifying what's really going on here. Remember the Buddha taught that a human being can only be these six properties, the four elements of nature, this, the fifth property of the space property and the sixth property of that consciousness property, which kind of is a container for all of this ignorance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then out of ignorance, those six properties creates, fabricate something that experiences life from that ignorant view called the five clinging aggregates. So while it seems substantial to us, the five clinging aggregates are just like the rest of ignorance. It's like foam on the ocean, like Lorna just described. There's truly nothing there, except we keep maintaining it over and over and over again. It takes tremendous effort. This is really the underlying uh, meaning of stress. It takes so much effort to keep maintaining me in an ignorant, fabricated way that it causes actual physical disease. They know that today. They've figured it out in the last 30 years. How debilitating, the number one cause of disease, I think they're going to declare one day, it wouldn't surprise me, is stress. They're going to say that. And it leads to all these other things. And where does, where does all stress come from? The stress that we're, we're concern, con, concerned about comes from ignorance that creates all these things. Another really, great all, question. All the thinking and, and when we go off on a publication, we're just recalling the five thing in our group. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, I must be getting ready for another, <laughs> another iPad or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It was acting up. Uh, yeah, it's all that. We're, we're, we're all just playing out until we come to the Dhamma, we're just playing out our own ignorance. And we don't, we don't recognize why we struggle. I didn't know why I was making, struggling so hard in so many personal relationships and business. pick one. And I always blame myself. Well, I, I was kind of right, but I wasn't, the blame wasn't really focused. I was, I was, I wasn't blaming my ignorance. I was blaming my inadequacy. That's just eye making, isn't it? To think of myself as inadequate or lacking something that's rooted in eye making. But when I can understand that it's ignorance that is my problem, then that's something I can do something about because ignorance implies a lack of knowledge. And I have this simple and direct path to gaining all the knowledge I need about myself and the world I live in. We just went through that four month study and, and it works. And that's why the last two classes are so important because you're developing mindfulness that core foundation mm -hmm. is what yes goes, that's where you see the, the aggregates that's where you see the hindrances yeah. and so on that's what the development is that's what the john development it's, is for yeah and you you can see it so clearly in what she what lorna saw as a, a dilemma is actually just the development it's just the development of the dog. But that's the evaluation part too. And what David was saying is um, when, when, when the mindfulness starts to become sort of um, more developed, um, <laughs> that ugly head of, of self-evaluation starts coming up. But, but, but again, it, but because now you're, it's, it's always been there, but you're recognizing it, I guess is yep. what I'm saying. And um, I guess that could tend to feel bad at that moment. And then you usually in Dhamma practice, you can understand what is occurring. So, that's yeah, that, but that's so, when you're gentle. Yeah, that's, that's right. What, it, it, that's the key to the Dhamma. Yeah, and that's when the, the that's why the, I say that the four foundations come in of being gentle with yourself and yeah, and yeah. It just it just means when we get past the self-referential aspect of even Dhamma practice, recognizing that. I'm rooted in ignorance is just a recognition that, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. This is what the Dhamma is designed to do. So when I come up against manifestations of my ignorance, mm. it's an opportunity in that the way to see it is that this is an opportunity right here, right now to practice the Dhamma. Mm. And how do we do it? This is not me. This is not mine. This is not what I am. That's the, that's the Dhamma right there. And anytime that we find ourselves out of our minds and out of our bodies, it's not me, it's not mine. Come back to what's occurring. Michael. And what is cognizant is only cognizant. It's cognizant. Yeah. Yep. It's cognizant, it's only cognizant. Yeah. And there's no you or I in it. What does that mean though? 
I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd like to hear you explain it. Uh, just basically all your thoughts and, uh, just, you know, um, and not attaching to yourself to them or fabricating yep. from there. And just like realize that, you know, this wrong thinking, okay, and wrong view, wrong, you know, uh, actually come with wrong uh, viewing, wrong thinking, just let, not let them take you over. Just realize that these are, these are thoughts that are ongoing here and they are, not me, not mine, not who yeah. I am. It's just the process that the mind going through what it does and, uh, uh, and, and getting away from us. Yep. And, and a, a thought has no power at all until it becomes conditioned. And then it doesn't have any real power, but it does have the power to keep us out of living our life. That's why the Buddha described a life rooted in ignorance as not living. That's the death state. The deathless state is being free of ignorance. And that's, that's just how it feels, doesn't it? Life becomes more meaningful for us as we develop the Dhamma, doesn't it? The, the little, the, the mundane aspects of life become apparent. I'm not going to say they become meaningful. They become apparent for the first time, I think. I mean, at least that's the way it's been for, with me. Things that I never noticed in my life are now noticeable simply because I'm there for them. Not that there are anything, you know, it's not that I just, I noticed there was a big pile of gold in the backyard that I've been missing all these years. The backyard, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to go look now. <laughs> all of the backyard is more meaningful, not because there's gold in it, but simply because I'm standing there in it. I'm present in it. Just like it, it just like Dhamma class is so meaningful because the method we use is a method that brings us into what's occurring right here, right now. That also mundane consciousness is at times. And yes, because that's where we are. That's what that's the, the, the Dhamma is meant to develop within a mundane, basic human consciousness. It's made, it's meant for human beings. It's not meant for unhuman beings or disincarnate beings or someone who has developed to a certain point where they're now ready for the Dhamma. I mean, that's the most laughable thing I've ever heard. The, the pre-qualifying, you have to do certain things. The Buddha never taught that. He never made any distinction among any human being. If they wanted to learn the Dhamma, he sat down and, and put his time in teaching that. And that's what we're all doing here. Remarkable. Uh, any of you folks online have anything to say before we give up this year? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I should say New, New, Year's is, New Year's Eve is never one of those holidays I can never quite understand why it was such a big deal to go from one year to the next. But, all right. Uh, uh, another a great class. Uh, we'll finish with meta as we always do. I think I got all the announcements. Yeah, the, uh, as David said, the, the two important classes are coming up on that study, Saturday and Tuesday, on Anapanasati Sutta. It puts a nice finishing touch on it. So, uh, all right, we'll finish with meta as we always do. So find your uh, meditative posture and take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small. The seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and un unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, Free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, 
having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Peace. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. See you all online. Get home Pretty, safe, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, John. Take care. Thank you, John. Take care, Thad. See you, Jane. See you, John. <laughs>